Hey, welcome to this episode of Gothcast. Wait a second. This was played before the intro. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I just want to let you know that this episode was actually recorded pre-2020, and then a whole bunch of stuff happened, and now it's being released at this particular time. So just wanted to let you know. Also, Riggs, random interesting goth stuff in the middle, is going to be a little bit different because punched it in later, and you're going to hear Cameron on that. But anyway, I'll let you get into this episode. It's an awesome one. I loved it. Welcome to Gath Guest, episode 56. I'm Dr. Sanders. Is it six? 56. Oh, man. Yeah. I thought I thought it was way more than that by now. No, 56. Yeah. That's where we're at right now. Oh, wow. I know. It's happening. We'll get there. We'll get to 100 soon. Yeah. We got to do something crazy for episode 100. I know. We got to do something crazy for episode 60, 70, 55, 33. Anyway. 27, 14. 27. There we go. Right there. There's a football joke for well, anybody who understands those. When we hit episode 1,000 next year right yeah <laughs> yeah about march yeah right? but yeah. yeah that's right let's see what time yeah. is it oh, okay yeah yeah anyway today we have kind of part three of an episode that we we're talking about this is going to be the frankenstein episode and that is because we well the podcast i did with robbie gore initially with dracula and we reviewed 1930s 1950s and the 1990s dracula and then me and brian did the Mummy episode from, you know, 1930s Mummy, and the Brandon Fraser, 1999 Mummy, and then the awful Tom Cruise one. And now we're doing Frankenstein. This is going to be a monstrous episode for you. You can say we cobble this together with reviews of other movies in some kind of mad way using science. And bubbling liquids. Yes, definitely. Anyway, <laughs> this is that. Uh, this is going to be the episode on Frankenstein. We're going to talk about 1931 Frankenstein, and then we're going to talk about 1957's Curse of Frankenstein, and then we're going to talk about 1994's... Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yeah. She did not direct that, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I noticed she didn't, she didn't write the first... She didn't write the book. The first one was based on either. Did you know that? What do you mean? Yeah. So, in the credits, it lists Mrs. Percy B. Shelley... In which, the in which, the credits, yeah, of the 1931 must, yeah, must be a completely different person than Mary Shelley, right? It's got to be really it's, different. Yeah, it's a different name. I wonder why that is. Yeah, because of sexism. That's boom. <laughs> is that because that thing where they they credit her husband or something yeah. at the time? Yeah, still. yeah. Wow, 1930s. Wow, right. That's ridiculous. Anyway, this is going to be three different interpretations of a very amazing book. If you haven't read the actual book Frankenstein, it's awesome and. It's really interesting to see the take on each of these movies. You know, it's the same story. Because, you know, like when we did The Mummy, what was weird is that it wasn't based on an actual, you know, story. And then all the movies had very similar elements. Right. They just said, well, we own this intellectual property. Let's just remake it using a lot of the same things that we, you know, we'll just reference the old movies. Yeah. But Frankenstein has a book as the basis. And all three of these are very different. And I like them each, well, I like most of them <laughs> for their own particular things they excel at, but some of them are a little more frustrating than others. I, honestly, it's kind of interesting to see the way they take some things from the books and the names and sometimes switch them around and different things. And we're going to see, especially with the certain versions, maybe they should have left stuff out or it's just, it's just really weird because sometimes you get the same story. Three different directors, three different decades. I think it'd be so radically different. Yeah. Let's start with probably the most classic Frankenstein movie of all time, at least for most people. That's going to be Frankenstein from 1931. Yeah. Surprisingly, for 1931, they had a lot of really cool set stuff. It's awesome. Yeah. This this movie was, of course, it was released after Dracula. Now, most people, it's really strange because most people will consider Frankenstein to be like the first classic universal movie. And I'm like, because Dracula came out right, you know, they were getting used to using sound. Most people feel it didn't embrace the medium of film enough, you know, where you could move around the cameras and really play with that sort of stuff. Most people feel like Dracula is a little more of like a stage play that's been filmed. Yeah. And in some ways, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong, but I, I think it's wrong to just say, oh, well, Frank is this, you know, Dracula didn't utilize film as well. So 
Frankenstein's the, you know, the real one. I'm like, no, that's, that's not how that works. You can't just retroactively be like, yeah, no, we didn't direct that movie. Yeah, that's not the first Universal one. Anyway, obviously, classic film directed by James Whale, who went on to do a whole bunch of other films. But the thing that most people remember about this movie is Boris Karloff as Frankenstein's monster. Oh, that was Boris Karloff? That is really, mm-hmm. yeah. I I didn't I didn't pay any attention to any of the characters other than Fritz. For this oh, movie. it's just Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only is Fritz uh, on screen or or talking. I don't care about it. Yeah, uh, if he's not, yeah, he's pretty amazing. Yeah. Became the archetype for Igor, obviously. Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. Is the differences in this book? The uh, differences between the book and the movie are plentiful in this one. Uh, first of all, they don't call Victor Victor. They call him Henry. Right. So it's Henry Frankenstein, and there is a character named Victor, but it's not the same character. Uh, they basically swapped the names. Of, yeah. And um, y- you have so many plot points that aren't in the book. So in the actual book itself, the monster like learns to read and becomes sentient and talks. And actually, part of the story is done through his perspective. It's a big part of the book. You know, the monster dealing with being rejected by his creator and all this stuff. There's none of that in here. The monster is rejected by Henry, I guess it's gonna be hard not to say Victor. Yeah, um, but that's n- that's not really a whole like it doesn't go into some inner turmoil and all stuff. And he doesn't like grapple poetically with it and all stuff. He's pretty much just doesn't say any words. He just grumbles and goes, rawr, rawr. and uh, of course does the classic thing where he like kind of saunters along and holds his arms out and is monstrous. And so a lot of the deeper elements of the book, other than you know, the madness of Henry creating the monster are just severely downplayed. You know, I think it works for what they're trying to go for. Looking at it nowadays, it's hard not to see this movie as not uh, a horror film. Yeah. There's there's so much uh, lack of character development mm-hmm. and there's so much cut out from the original, you know, story. I mean, you have to. Not only are they working with a very limited amount of film you know, for these kinds of films and, mm-hmm. and, you know, production had to be really tight and movie lengths were very, very short compared to today's lengths. Yes. Um, so, you know, they, they have to cut a lot out, but it's definitely one of the things that kind of makes this just more like a short. Um, yeah. Is they need to introduce the people and the ideas very quickly and they don't really spend a whole lot of time on development of any of it and then, you know, go into like, oh yeah, there's this horrible monster who's terrifying. Yeah. Well, they do. Here's the whole thing about the, about this particular movie, and we're not reviewing them today. But there are multiple sequels to it, right? So you have the Bride of Frankenstein, Ghost of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein. I don't know which order they go in. I know Bride second, but you have these other movies that expand upon it. But we're just reviewing this as one movie, the first one, you know, taken as is, and it is a very basic formula. But it's where it came from. You know, it's one of the first movies to have the formula of. Monster created. Oh no, it's crazy. Uh, get the pitchforks and and then okay, it's over. Yeah, it's and it's really easy to nitpick nowadays because we have all these longer, more developed pieces, and technology makes it a heck of a lot less expensive to to do this kind of thing. Uh, by comparison, not that that's necessarily how how horror movies are. I mean, a lot of horror movies these days are made on a lower budget, but yeah, well, yes, <laughs> but but uh, but yeah, you could do a lot more with less. Is is what I'm saying now. You know, if you're in the 1930s and you're going out and seeing a movie, by comparison, it's pretty good. Yeah. This is pretty frightening, too. If I remember correctly, there was like a warning, like somebody came out and introduced it and be like, just be warned. This is like very scary, you know, like, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure for you know, for the time, it was insanely frightening to people. It's really good in so many ways. And one is that uh, Colin Clive, the actor who portrays Henry, again, Victor, Henry, whatever, you know, he is so good he's so wild-eyed and plays like the mad scientist perfectly he's just like a wild animal oh you yeah. know <laughs> yeah commanding commanding presence and very demanding of fritz other than that i can't comment because i wasn't paying attention oh because it because it didn't fritz, involve fritz, fritz, fritz yeah, was in the yeah, scene you didn't know yeah, yeah he's, he just had the whole like you know the, well of course from this movie that it's live it's alive you know after he sent the creature up in the lightning, and he just freaks. Of course, that's been parodied uh, who knows how many times. I mean, I don't even think you could do it. I don't even think you could get a, a list of how many times it's been parodied and referenced to. And it, and that comes from his acting. That you know, Essentially, that's where it became the 
cliched Catch lines. Phrase, yeah. yeah. And, um, there's probably a lot of people who know that phrase and don't know where it came from. Yeah. Or there's no, oh, it's from Frankenstein. They don't know that, understand that it's from this Frankenstein. Like it's from this movie. That's where it's from. And uh, like even just that, that's like a historical piece of cinema. And the cinematography and stuff, I have to really come in for the time. It has this huge sense of verticality that I seriously don't think, even today, some movies don't get it because. Keep in mind, back then, you know, you really had to build the sets. Like, the, this, most of these things would be physical items. And if they weren't, a lot of them were, like, glass matte paintings where they had to, like... It was very difficult to do with matte paintings. So, sometimes it was just easier to get a good background. Yeah. Yeah. Cr- like, trying to create something from scratch took more work than just finding a good a good location or making the set. Yeah, exactly. And there's so many shots in this movie that take up... You know, you'll see the the character will be a very small part of it, and then you see this gigantic, you know, stone wall, or like the and then the staircase that goes all the way up the screen, and they'll walk all the way down it. Or uh, it's like I think there's a shot where the creatures in the lab, and you know, you just see the verticality of it all the way up to the ceiling. There's just stuff and, and like stone, and it's just crazy the way they do it. I'm like, man, even movies today have trouble getting that sense of size. Oh yeah, and this movie. And probably because a lot of it had to be practical, they probably they really got it. That was like one of the things that I noticed is just like, dang, like this this really nails it. Yeah, and another part of the set that I really liked is just that there was, uh, or the set design that I really liked is there was a lot of you know they had to do practical effects for all the electrical components and stuff mm-hmm. they show on screen, but also there's a lot of detail in the different you know kind of tchotchkes and stuff in all of the various locations, mm-hmm. um, you know in the uh, the office of the professor and the uh, you know all of the you know the bubbling test tubes and the the microscope and you know in, in his study he's got that row of skulls and everything you know there's just a lot of different things where they paid attention to detail and nowadays you know they might just throw a bunch of you know random looking things together and be like okay that's good enough or whatever but it it looks like somebody spent a lot of a lot of attention a lot of time and attention on it yeah i would totally agree with that of course people are going to complain nowadays a little bit about uh, well it's so old you know 1930s like that seems so far away now but and it is black and white it's also not in widescreen it wasn't filmed you know, it's four by three aspect ratio, which means if you're watching on like a modern TV, it has a black bars. And some people don't don't know how to deal with that for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> um, they freak out about it. Yeah. Or and why is everybody fat? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> people stretch it. <laughs> yeah. It looks so weird. They're all wide. Yeah, when they raise their arms, their arms like grow <laughs> like several feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a funny one. It does like the panoramic scaling. Oh, so yeah. It's so weird. But um. Yeah, that's that's something that's gonna I think be hard for some people. If you want to watch this movie, there's like a million different ways to watch this movie. You know, tons of DVDs, lots of different releases of it. Actually, some amazing Blu-rays releases of this. S- seriously, they're amazing. I, I think it's definitely worth your while. So many different pieces of trivia I could say about this movie. I'll just run off a few crazy ones. Uh, one is that this movie pretty much left Boris Karloff with ailments for the rest of his life to some extent. Uh, he said that he had permanent scars where the spirit gum had been applied for the electrodes on his neck. Right. He said that it actually scarred him for the rest of his life. Also, there is a scene where the creature is carrying the professor up a hill. And there's something where, like, the director was, I don't know if he's worried or he's jealous that he thought, like, oh, well, this, like, Boris is going to get so much attention. I'm not going to get any of the credit for this, like, movie. And so he made him carry him up the hill like tons of times, like so many. And keep in mind, this co- his costume was insanely heavy, like all that makeup, everything. And so it left him with like permanent back problems the rest of his life. Wow. And the, and even I think Clive was like, well, you don't have to carry him. You can just carry a dummy up. And the director insisted, no, you need to carry him up that hill. And he did it like so many times. And he just had like back problems the rest of his life. He had multiple surgeries and all this stuff. And that that's so crazy. Also, the makeup for this movie, it's works super well it's weirdly subtle in it in a weird way because you know they took boris karloff's face i mean if you see his face you're like oh that could you could totally see the fr- the creature in it right but jack pierce makeup extraordinaire basically created all of the makeup for all the universal monsters amazing guy it's a very sad story uh what happened to him maybe we'll talk about it some other time but 
he created the makeup and kind of the look of the creature. It doesn't look anything like it does in the book. The book, it kind of talks about how he's grotesque and he looks like people stitched together and everything and matted long hair and it doesn't really resemble that. And so he kind of made up his own you know, idea of like, oh, you know, the flat top head and the electrodes coming out of the neck. And I forget how the green thing came about. Like, I don't know how people came to the conclusion that he was supposed to be green. I think it was maybe a poster or something. I think there's some story as to how people just assumed he was green. But what's crazy about all this is that the makeup is still copyrighted today. So that's why whenever you see like a Frankenstein movie and they do a creature, it doesn't look like that. Because if they did a green skinned one with electrodes and all this, and the, the, it'd be against the copyright of it. Yeah, the infringement. So Universal owns it. And it's copyrighted still until like 2026. So it's still like from the 1930s till now, that look is still copyrighted. And that's why you get so many um, like masks and like Halloween costumes and stuff that are just different enough to not be copyright infringing. Yeah. You know, they have like a big wide like part of the head and they have like a, it's like a cartoony parody look of it and that's because it's copyrighted so keep an eye out for our movie that we're releasing in 2027 that's going to be frankenstein starring us yeah and uh and we'll be ripping off that intellectual property as hard as we can we're both going to be the creature right both going to be green yeah. both with electrodes yeah it's going to be a whole thing we're going to bring each other to life that's it yeah it's called my two frankensteins right yeah <laughs> pretty good two frankensteins and a baby there you go right yeah. there yeah that'll be the sequel and let's right. call him victor <laughs> victor henry frankenstein where is the diaper bag oh <laughs> uh, yeah yep yeah speaking of crotchety old people us yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you did you notice that... Uh, I know what you meant by that. <laughs> the uh, the old man Baron uh, got frustrated by the door technology, uh, locking doors. He was very frustrated by, by door locks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's with all this nonsense of locked locking doors? Locking doors. <laughs> yeah. That guy played a very good, like, kind of crotchety old... Yeah. Douchebag. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, dang, he's he's must have been that way in real life somehow because he plays it well. Oh yeah, no, he must have done a, a good job because I actually paid attention to him even when Fritz wasn't on the screen. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Another famous fact about this movie: Bella Lugosi turned down the role. Uh, why? Why is that? So apparently, there's this whole thing, and I, and I know there's been so much like uh, speculation over this over the years, and some of it's been confirmed, some of it's hearsay from people. But the story as I as I have heard it is that uh, he had done Dracula, and you know Dracula's makeup is just subtle, you know, stage makeup essentially. I thought Dracula was thirty two. Dracula is thirty one. The Frankenstein is thirty one. They're both thirty one. Oh, I was saying the whole thing like where people considered that one the first one. Oh, that's right. But yeah, so he had done Dracula and was like, well, I don't want to do a role where my face is covered. I don't want to be makeup all day. I don't want to do all this stuff, you know, like, I want to be famous for being this. And so, you know, passed on it. And then Boris Karloff got it. And then, of course, Boris Karloff, most people would agree he had a much better career. Yeah. That as time went on. Kind of made him the monster guy for everything for a long time. Yeah. And kind of, and still had the horror career going into the 60s. And uh, yeah, it's one of the first years. And Bela Lugosi did eventually play Frankenstein, but... He's not what people remember as, you know, the creature. Right. And a lot of people, I mean, I just got to remember, I mean, Boris did the mummy too. I mean, when we did the mummy, like he's another classic horror villain, but it required a ton of makeup, it required all this stuff, and it was painstaking, and he suffered a whole bunch for it. Isn't that the one where he like, you like break his ankles or something, <laughs> like doing that one? And yeah, it was uh, crazy. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things he would put himself through and really do these probably awful roles if you thought about like what it took to make them, but he was willing to do it. And so, uh, yeah, that the Bella Gossi thing is one that I think frustrated him for a long time. At least that's what the speculation was. I've got some additional speculation for you. Yeah. Uh, you the, the town, the town that, uh, uh, Baron Frankenstein lives in mm -hmm. must be pretty rich. Yeah. Well, because uh, Henry Frankenstein was doing his experiments in the windmill, right? Yeah. And at the end of the movie, they light a windmill on fire, but yeah. it's a different windmill. So that town had two windmills at least, which 
which is a pretty big deal because that's a lot of grain to have to go through the windmill, which means that their geo, you know, their gross domestic uh-huh. product, right? Their GDP must have been pretty, pretty good. My gosh. Probably a, probably a big, big, big grain exporter, that village. Yeah. Yeah, that or I think one was a model. Maybe. Yeah. Huh. Honk, honk. <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> well yeah so that's pretty much the original Frankenstein there's like another million piece of trivia I could throw out there one is that this is I think this is one of the most expensive movie posters that has ever existed wow there's a like classic Frankenstein poster you know the one that like most people know I'm pretty sure that that's considered the re-release one it's like the one that most people, like, when you see, like, oh, that's a Frankenstein poster. I think that's technically a re-release poster. One of the original ones, the one of the original 1931 Frankenstein posters uh, is, I believe, in a private collection and something worth, like, several hundred thousand dollars or something. It's, like, crazy. Nice. And um, I saw that in, like, a documentary a long time ago where it was, like, hung up. And the person's like, yeah, I'll never get rid of it or something, or I don't know. I don't know if they did now. It was probably, that was a long time ago, but I remember seeing that poster and being like, oh, like, yeah, I don't think he's they ever like done a scan of it or anything. Wow. And this was a long time ago, so they, they might have now, but I remember that being like infamously like one of the most expensive vintage posters that it like was available at the time. Yeah. So look that up to see if there's any updates to that story. Yeah, and if you live in the area where the poster's housed, uh, check your thrift stores as soon as that guy kicks the book. Right, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Oh, dad's poster. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. He always did like that, Frank and who. I'm convinced that's how a lot of the awesome stuff, you know, that we find at thrift stores gets there. Oh, I already know it is, yeah. yeah. that's I, Yeah, I worked in that business. Yeah. <laughs> People are just like, I guess somebody says drop this off at the thrift store. I'm like, all right, well, I'll move this body for you. I used to work in a mortuary. Okay, it's not that weird. I know. I know I, you I, know that, yeah. but I know that they. Don't, I, if yeah. I say that out of context, <laughs> like, "Hey, I'll move this body." I used to move bodies for a mortuary, and so then people would be like, "I'm just going to donate all the stuff to Goodwill." You guys can't see this, but he's he's when he says the word mortuary, he's got air quotes. Yeah. More. Oh yeah. Is that, is that, is that what I did? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I uh, I Jeff, work for the mortuary. Jeff's mortuary. Right. <laughs> you spill them, we grill them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jeff the Guns Mortuary. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh man. But yeah, this uh, it's an amazing film. Like I said, we're not talking about any of the sequels for this today because I guess if we should, maybe we'll do that. Like maybe we'll do like a 1930s Frankenstein episode or something like that because they are all very good and they're all very short. By the yeah. way, you can watch pretty much. You can probably marathon them all in a day and not feel like you really was like sitting down to do it. It'd you be know. easier to watch all of those than The Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that one. But, uh, I mean, even, even, you know, for Lord of the Rings fans, I'm just saying like the, the movies are really long. They are very long. <laughs> yes. So you, that is, get, you get five movies for the time of three. Absolutely. Or actually, two. Maybe. Two. Yeah. I think maybe two, two. Yeah. I think two. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm pretty sure the last one, I'm pretty sure it like clocks in like just over an hour or maybe like it's super short. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I'm pretty sure they, and then even they, you know, these old movies, they use copious amounts of, remember this happened? Because they couldn't go back and watch the old movie. Right. So like, there's like stuff that recaps it. It's like, you know, let's fast forward that. And then, you yeah. know, but uh, yeah, Frankenstein, 1931, amazing. Yeah, watch it. Pay attention to Fritz. He's got really, really good lines oh and as far as i know at this point <laughs> as far as i know at this point it has not been colorized so so i throw that out there okay oh you know what i i wanted to say one last thing about frankenstein say 1931 yeah. yeah uh if anybody has any interest i, I think i want to redub this movie um with sound effects uh oh. some additional sound effects um to make it into a comedy horror for, <laughs> for today's day and age yeah uh right and so then you can have like you know the the running away sounding fact. You know the oh man, I'm not gonna do it. You know like when <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, when he throws the throws the uh, you know kid in the water, yeah. and then he and then he kind of like runs away, Keystone Cops style, like the paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, if you did inside 1974, and you also include the other movies, you have Young Frankenstein. Oh my gosh, it's so much work. By the way, if you just case you're wondering, like if you like Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein is just a parody of this series of Frankenstein movies. Yeah. It's all just jokes 
on the basis of the of these movies. Right. So, so I throw that out there. But like I said, we're not reviewing those today. So anyway, that's Frankenstein, 1931. Welcome to Random Interesting Goth Stuff. A.K.A. Riggs. All right, so you may be wondering, who the heck is that voice? Uh, as I said in the beginning of this podcast, this episode was pre-recorded with Brian several months back before the craziness of 2020 had gone into full swing. The lovely chaos. Yes, and uh, so just going in and punching in this random interesting guy stuff, at least to make it a little bit more um, relevant, I guess, yeah. I guess is the word. Um, Up to date. Yeah, because uh, especially since people are going to be listening to this episode right now, you know, in December of 2020, probably. I mean, people listen to the episodes, I know, much later as well, but... But primarily. But I thought that, you know, if you listen to this right now, to know it's a little more relevant. Um, you're going to talk about some of the stuff that took me a little while to get done. That was kind of the... Uh, I guess the reason, one of the main reasons why th- there was such a big gap is in the time that we recorded the episode, obviously there's a worldwide pandemic thing going on. When it was quarantine, nobody could really talk to each other. And Gothcast has always been recorded. There's never been a single episode of Gothcast that's been recorded over Skype or Zoom. Or it's always been recorded. Two people in a room sitting right next to each well, that's other. That's when you get the best response, you know? Yeah. So I, that was one of the reasons where it's like, well, you know, me and Brian couldn't actually be in a room together if we wanted to. Right quarantine and anything like that so um yeah and so i was like oh well i need to do something that's probably a little that's like really productive so finished an album in that time period uh from about january to say june or something like that i want to say it was june july something like that so that's that's cameron is the drummer in Hi. my band <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the making the album is pretty complicated in a lot of ways, it is out now. It's called Patch Overlap, Dr. Sanders, Patch Overlap. The band is called Dr. Sanders. Um, think you of are, it. You were called Dr. Sanders. I know that I, on the podcast, you know, as <laughs> am Dr. Sanders, but the band is called Dr. Sanders. It just kind of ended up working out that way. Weird timing on that. But, um, but yeah, think of it like, uh, like how Rob Zombie has a band, right? You're like, you don't think of Rob Zombie doesn't do all the stuff. He doesn't play the guitar. Or Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper, yeah, right. I don't know, Marilyn Manson. I know that's there probably sacrilege for this podcast. Oh, but, whatever. But you know what I mean. <laughs> or Peter Murphy, right? Hey, Peter Murphy's go. band is not yeah. not just Peter Murphy playing all the instruments. So think of it like that, where Dr. Sanders' band is really the core members. It's Cameron, Jacob, me, jamming out. Got a real nice feel. Couldn't do it without him. That's how music works. It's obviously very reliant on everybody, collective. Anyway... So I'm getting all too sappy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the album is out now. You can find it on Bandcamp. Uh, you can find it on Spotify. It's just Dr. Sanders, D-R period, S-A-N-D-E-R-S. The album's called Patch Overlap. A lot of good songs, in my opinion. Shh. Ten, great, ten great. hits. Ten, that's, ten, that's ten what, full that's hits, That's what I should have called it, just ten. <laughs> ten hits. Ten yeah. hits. <laughs> no, but it's a really personal record. Um, goes over a lot of the stuff. I know some people are familiar with the history I've had with a lot of crazy stuff in the last few years. In the past couple of months, I've heard all the craziness. Yeah. So Cameron's, Cameron knows. I mean, people know I've had health issues. I've had just a lot of crazy, crazy stuff happen. And a lot of that came out in the songwriting of um, Apache Overlap and uh, very therapeutic in a lot of ways. But overall, I think it's just some songs I'm really proud of. We love playing them. Uh, but yeah, you can go find it. Actually, released it on Cherry On cassette. Red, cassette. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds great on my Walkman. Yeah. It's, a trans, it's how I practice. Translucent <laughs> Cherry Red cassette. Totally. I'll uh, get some uh, shirts and stuff up there. Stickers, buttons. Yeah. So if you ever, and I know people have always been asking, is there going to be Gothcast merch? Is it? Well, I, you know, I never really saw the point of making merch for the YouTube or the podcast necessarily. I've always thought about it, but it right. always seemed like. The well, band, the band's a bit more of a better excuse to yeah, because to have that kind of merch. It feels like much more my product, right? Instead of sure. being like on something where I review and talk about somebody else's things, right? And so I thought it was like the perfect opportunity to do that. Yeah. And so, uh, and the merch looks cool, man. Well, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't, <laughs> don't want to toot your I mean, own people, horn. People can uh, go check it out for themselves. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's Dr. Sanders. Bandcamp.com. Again, that is D R S A N D E R S dot b-a-n-d-c-a-m-p dot c-o-m 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I can't believe they did that. I know. But yeah, you can check it out there. But like I said, you can stream on Spotify, Apple Music, and, uh, everything. Probably a million other places I've never even used. I think you can find it on Tidal. Isn't I don't that, even know what that is. I think that's Jay Z's Spotify or something. Wait, really? I think so. <laughs> I have no clue. I think so. I'm out of the loop on that, man. Uh, so uh, I just stick to my good old cassette. Yeah, the cassette, <laughs> I'll tell you, the cassette is that it's, it's gnarly. More people have been like. That is so awesome. Then, like, I it looks I, good I, too. I, the artwork's on it, nice. It's yeah, just go check it out. Oh, also, if you want to see, I mean, probably most people who listen to podcasts are obviously following YouTube. Like I said, more I did the anniversary or like the video where I updated everybody on kind of what was going on, talking about the new music, talking about the anniversaries of the podcast, five years on the podcast. Congratulations, it's crazy five years on YouTube. Uh, yeah, I'm always working on stuff. There's definitely no shortage of things I am working on. With video, you're a, bit of, you're a bit of a workaholic. As I'm, a total I've come workaholic. To know I'm a total workaholic. I'm total workaholic. There's always more YouTube videos coming. The most recent one, as of recording this right now, is the music video for Grey Matter Trial to promote the album, give yeah. people an idea. My first music video. Yes, your first music video. It's this crazy. Drummer. He's the one with the gigantic blue mohawk. It's not gigantic anymore right. as of now. Cut it before the like right. A it was like after. it was like a week or two after we filmed that. I yeah. was like, all right, time to cut it in half. Yeah, so I want to be able to sit up in my car. And my hair's pink in that video. Yeah. Yeah, my hair's green now. Yeah. Uh, as of recording this, I know nobody can see it out there, but so but that's just how album releases work. You know, you just you prepare everything up until that point. You get all the music ready and you're like, Okay, now I need to make a cover. Okay, now I need to make music videos. Now right. I need, it's so weird because it's like the almost the easiest part of it is making the music in some ways where you're because you just like write a song, you record it, you mix it, it's done, right? Right. But then you have to do all the other things that give it more life and people are interested in it. You know, I think that's where I've uh, lacked on my previous projects. And I think that's something I'm learning from you now. I've just kind of formed really scrappy projects and just kind of shot for it. But maybe having a little bit more preparation is... Uh, it's hard. Instrumental. <laughs> I, was, yeah, right. yeah. I was, you know, it's like, it's it's hard. Just like anything to prepare something and sit on it and to be like, right. oh, it's it's... It's going to be good when it's out. It's going to be really good when it's out. It's going to be, you know. Anyway, I didn't mean to take so long to talk about this, but it's, I don't know, it, was a, it was a big project. That was one of the reasons why. It's a big thing. So why was one of the reasons a lot of, I slowed down on a lot of the other stuff. Um, other than just the mental health stuff of dealing with 2020, you know, I don't like, I don't ever like slowing down. I know that some people, I mean, nobody really ever accused me of releasing content, you know, like, oh, you should release things right now, you know, whatever it's. Yeah, I think most people understand that I try to have a, I really balance Gothcast with my mental health, which is very hard. I was trying to make so 2020 was a, has been a somewhat pleasant experience. It's been freaking hard. Like I mean, even I've had some, I've had some moments I'll never forget for the rest of my life this year. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely monumental. It's something that I don't think is going away in my mind. It's uh, going to change a lot of things for a lot of people. Yeah. So I just, uh, anyway, uh, the album's out. And so I thought I would uh, talk about some of the stuff that's happened, I guess, recently or somewhat recently. I guess this whole year feels like it's gone both super fast and super slow. Yep. Uh, let's talk about some stuff. So obviously one of the main things is for a lot of bands, we've had tours be canceled, right? So we've Yay! had tons of tours be canceled. We had- No music. We had, um, <laughs> I believe the the Peter Murphy Bauhaus reunion stuff. I think that all those got pushed back. Uh, I don't even know what they're going to be now. Um, we had The Mission canceling their tours. Um, I know Corpus Delecti was going to do some stuff. No idea. I mean, yeah. what's cool is they're staying active through like Facebook and all, and all the social media stuff. Okay. Um, also, like uh, Peter Hook and The Light. That was something that's really cool. You know, he's awesome. I'm reading his book right now, by the way. Very nice. Um, his last book, the Joy Division book, got my one of my top five books of the year. Oh, you like, just read me the the rules of being in a band. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's really funny. <laughs> I, mean, I think we've broken a couple of those we rules. We already did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't be in friends. Don't be friends in your band. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, all that got canceled. And luckily, like, he's one of those people who's been staying really active through YouTube and stuff and doing, like, a lot of that stuff on there, and it's awesome. And that, that's one of the things that's been really cool about the whole 2020 thing is it's given a lot of people time to relax and maybe focus on doing more of the fan interaction stuff. Right. Not worried about doing other stuff. You can actually sit down, talk with people, and especially now that we live in such a digital age, we can reach anyone at any time, yeah. at any minute. Yeah, and that's been a that's been a really cool thing to see how bands are trying to adapt to being like, well, we can't tour. Uh, do we just do nothing? Or do we, hey, remaster all our old music videos? Do right. we 
do like live stream videos? Do we do, uh, you know, it's like, so it's been cool to see every, the workarounds. Yeah, everyone's strategy. What's going on? But here's some cool albums that come out, have come out. Uh, Lebanon, Hanover, I think that's how you say it. Came out with a new album. Super awesome. Very I know nice. a lot of people really like also the meme ness of that band, M E M E. Oh, there you go. Dash yeah. M-E-S, yeah <laughs> this is a dancing gif. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we also have Rose Garden Funeral Party, album at stake. Great album. Super awesome. Wish I could get it on cassette. Oh, God. <laughs> I know Rob Zombie put out a single recently we listened to, King Freak, uh, Crypt of some, some Ridiculously Long Name. Of course. Sounds like Rob Zombie. Sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rosetta Stone also came out with another album called Cryptology. That's crazy. It's so funny because... I, the weirdest thing, I, I talked about it on one of the previous episodes, that Rosetta Stone hadn't released an album for like a million years, and I did a video about him, and then I was like, oh, they probably won't do anything. And then all of a sudden, they released an album. There you go. After like, it's like, oh, after 30,000 years, never was going to happen. Now we release a new album. And then they're doing new releases. So that's awesome. As I say every single time, it never happens yet. The Cure are supposed to be, supposed to? Yeah, be making some kind of new album or something. But I've said that a billion times on this podcast never happens and it never happens they said they're all ready to go uh on like three new albums or whatever and um yeah okay <laughs> yeah i mean last year i think it was last year i want to say we had curation which was like or cure whatever it is it's c-u-r-a-e-t-i-o-n which was like this compilation of like it was like two shows and um there was actually a new song in there uh so that I mean that release was cool. Still no new album, but um, I guess a lot of talk. There's always a, well, the Cure is pre- it's pretty infamous at this point of saying like, you know, oh, God, I want to say it's I don't even know what years I've said it, but like they would say, oh, it's definitely coming out. Oh, it's totally definitely coming out. <laughs> and then like Sisters of Mercy, you know, Andrew Eldridge said, oh, if Trump wins the presidency, I'm gonna release a new album because no, I didn't, th- you know, he didn't think it was gonna happen, right? And then it did happen, and then we still have no new album. Basically, my, my point in this is, check out those new albums. A lot of them are awesome. It's cool that like a lot of bands are becoming more active in this time, and a lot of them are doing really cool stuff because there's no real thing you can do to distract you from either interacting with fans or kind of just to stay active. They make there's no, videos. There's no excuse now. Yeah, exactly. No excuse at all. Yeah, it's not like, oh, we couldn't record music because we were too busy touring or, you know, we couldn't make videos because we were touring. Yeah, try it, using that excuse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now the biggest excuse people have is, hey, I don't want, you know, we don't want to get sick. We don't want to interact with each other. Right. But then so many bands are like, you can make music without being in a room. Exactly. You know, and so, um, especially if you use like a drum machine. <laughs> like, oh, you know, you if that's your band's thing. Well, there goes my job. Oh, yep. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> My, my most hated member is a drum machine. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> they listen too well. <laughs> anyway, that's a random interesting guest stuff. I didn't want this to go on for too long, but I thought I would just insert this one here so there's a little bit more of an updated, more modern one. So uh, let's get back to Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Take it away, Brian. And me? Not me. Not you. Not me. No. No. Goodbye, Cameron. See ya. Brian. Donnie. I wish I could go into the future about 26 years from the last movie that we reviewed. And I wish they would do another version of Frankenstein. Oh, uh, like maybe a version where there's a uh, some sort of magic or something involved? Uh, that's what it would look like on screen if you're seeing the weird contraptions they have. Yeah. Well, I meant like like somebody, somebody there's a, like a hex or something? Or... Or a repeating theme that keeps coming back to haunt people? Yes. That would be interesting. Yeah. I, well, you're in luck. And can you shoot it in Eastman color? I, I, you know, uh, I think I think we could do that. And can you also star two people who end up being inside of Star Wars later? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no promises. Okay. All right. Probably one from like the 70s one and then one from like the 2000s one. Okay. Yeah. Then we, I think we could do that. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, this is The Curse of Frankenstein, released in 1957. One of my favorite movies of all time. 
Definitely. I mean, it might be my number one favorite horror movie. Uh, probably Evil Dead 2 is probably number one, but this is very close. Amazing, amazing movie. Our spoilers right there. So it's Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, Hazel Court, also pretty much everybody else who was a horror actor for, became you know horror actor for Hammer. Awesome, awesome film. This was what many consider to be the first color horror film. And you'll see that everywhere. Was it actually... I don't know, maybe, but it was the most famous one. That's for sure. And super strange way it came about. You know, they wanted to do this horror movie and I don't think anybody really had any faith in it because by this point, especially with the 40s, there was a decline in horror movies really badly. And with the invention of television, you have more of a resurgence because you could play them on TV and it was like, oh, that's interesting. And they were like, well, hey, let's bring back this Frankenstein concept. And Hammer Studios, Hammer Horror, the classic Hammer Horrors. They did tons. They did Dracula, ser- a Dracula series, a Frankenstein series, and a Mummy series. Also, a ton of other things. Gorgon's pretty good, too. They were like, well, we want to do this Frankenstein film. And <laughs> Universal threatened them with lawsuits saying, okay, you can't copy us. You know, this makeup's under copyright. Like, if you try to copy our film, it's gonna we're going to sue you, you know, because we didn't, like, we didn't do a straight adaptation of the book. So, if you take our elements, then we're going to sue you. And say, like, okay, well... Uh, uh, there is why they didn't do the straight ad- adaptation of the book. Yeah. And, right? s- and so, they did, They did like, they took it and they were like, well, we need to take some more elements from the book. So, we're, like, closer to it and, and we're farther away from the Universal thing. So, we can't... Because they were, I think they were planning on doing something a little bit closer to the Universal one. Right. They're like, okay, we got to do more of the book stuff. And so, what they did is they rewrote it to be close to the book. Obviously, they we finally have Victor Frankenstein. Right. Uh, played by Peter Cushing. By the way, if you remember, very soon after this, Peter Cushing was Van Helsing. So, it's really strange in this movie you have the creature is Christopher Lee and, you know, he plays a very good creature. Yeah. Um, and then a year later, he'd be playing uh, Count Dracula. And so, it's, it's just so funny because then you have Christopher Lee kind of leaving the Frankenstein franchise and then he just became Dracula. And then there's a whole series of these movies is like, I think five or six. I can't, I always have trouble remembering how many there are with Peter Cushing and he's in like all of them. And so it's very interesting to see the change in that. I think both of them, I think Peter Cushing was much happier being Victor Frankenstein than Christopher Lee was being Dracula. Hmm. (laughs) They kind of take a lot more of the elements from the book and put it into this film. And you have a lot more of the, the kind of friendship stuffs between like Victor and Paul and that sort of thing. And, you very much feel that Victor's, I don't know, it's, you just get so much, so many more sides of him. And by the way, in this movie, he's a total jerk. Yeah. He's horrible. He's absolutely awful. Yeah. 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 And that's one of the, the first things you learn about him. Yeah. Yeah. When he's a kid? Yeah. When he's a kid. He yeah. Is, he's kind of a jerk. He's kind of, yeah, he's, he's very direct. <laughs> yeah. that way yeah he has very little tact I, I guess i guess yeah he's i don't know if he's intending to be a jerk or not but that's how it comes off yeah paul comes and he's like hey you know like he thinks that an adult had called him to be victor's tutor and so when he shows up it's like the kid victor is like no i'm the one who's hiring you like like i am the the man of the the manor you know yeah like i am the head of my household at this point and so because it was just a passing in the family he's like no i want you to teach me and so he's like, okay, like, I'll still pay you the whatever. He's like, all right. all right, sure, I guess. And so him and Paul become great friends. They kind of, you know, they play off one another. But then as they get older, uh, Victor is really wanting to push this whole like bringing back life. Like, can you cheat death and bring back like a dog? They uh, just do a lot of really crazy stuff. And it's all very interesting too. It's <laughs> the lab is very, <laughs> very 50s. And yeah, that, there's like lots of lots of good practical effects there too. Yeah, but very dated. Yeah, I mean it's really c- cool, and they took advantage. I gotta say they really took advantage of color. So Eastman color by today's standards, and this is coming from somebody who spent a lot of time with film. Eastman color, it was uh, I b- believe at the time it was one of the more more popular one strip techniques for it, where they would condense the colors down. Right. Like without having to do like the three strip technicolor, you need to develop it like essentially three times and combine it and do the key color and all that stuff. This is like one of the, the processes where you could get like you basically shoot it and develop it and you would get color. And it was not the greatest in my opinion. It it had the, um, the kind of issue you have where a lot of in-between tones get lost. You basically have like greens and reds 
for a lot of this movie. And that's okay. It reminds me of some of the older, less well taken care of episodes of Gilligan, uh, Gilligan's Island. Oh, where they like color wise. I mean, like, yeah, which uh, is like lacking in some. Yeah, like or, or some colors are completely gone. It seems like yeah, like it seems like yellows and stuff never really worked that well with that particular technique. Yeah, uh, it just seems like you have a lot of um, kind of you have a lot of browns, greens, and reds. That's kind of what I always feel like is for those kind of techniques for back then. You get a lot of those, and while the the restoration stuff that we have today are really good, you know, we watched in HD, the um, the version we watched, it looks pretty good compared to the one I used to watch, but sure. it's still probably not uh, as good as it would have been if they had done like maybe some kind of technicolor process or something where it was a little more separated, but it probably wouldn't have got made if they had done that. Right. <laughs> well, and at the same time, too, you know, the, the technicolor is almost always going to look better because you're the aging process of the film is much slower. Yeah. And also you just separate it easily and it's yeah. just all, all this stuff, you know, you can just, you have a better chance with it, but I still think it looks really good. And for being the first color horror movie, I think it like, you know, with the preservation of it and the way it is so far, I think that's, I'm like, oof, they, they got it down. Yeah. I will say the sound always, no matter what version I watch, the sound always is kind of tinny or scratchy. But again, that's probably just because, they weren't using super hi-fi. It wasn't like Stanley Kubrick or something. Yeah, being they like using great $15 microphones like it, us. Exactly. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's the truth. But all things considered, this I think it's a great restoration. This has just come from like a film nerdy perspective. The movie itself is amazing. And that I s- just mostly comes from Peter Cushing being so, so much fun to hate. <laughs> he is such a jerk. Partway through the movie, and by the way, this does take more from the book, you know, bringing back, like, Elizabeth to, to a larger degree, and you have a lot of the turmoil with that. It still cuts out almost all of the stuff with the monster being sentient and being able to speak and all that stuff. Really just has it as more of, like, a classical monster movie, but it does add in some of those elements of the uh, tragedy of Elizabeth, and it even has some own psychological elements to it that are not really in any other version of it, but it's... Um, yeah, I mean, there was uh, some real suspense for me there when I couldn't figure out whether or not he was thinking or planning on using Paul's brain. Right, I know. You know, you like you can almost see gears turning in his yeah. head, and that's hard to achieve as an actor. Yeah, I, I don't know how they didn't get sued, honestly, so in some ways with this. Because, yes, they did change it quite a bit, and they did take a lot more from the book. But they also did just add kind of their own stuff a little bit. But uh, there's like a whole thing where Victor is like cheating on Elizabeth with the maid, and right, and like he's and he is so evil. He's she's basically like the maid is like, I'll ride on you. Like you know, if you don't if you don't be with me and you're gonna be with her, then I will tell everyone what you're doing. And he just kills her. He yeah. leads her to the monster and then traps her in there, and then the, the creature kills her. So it's like he is brutal. And not in the way that the book portrays him to be brutal. You know, it's not, I mean, that isn't really, I guess it does further his experiments, but not in, I mean, not really. (laughs) Yeah. It's really him just covering his butt. Yeah, exactly. But you have the elements of like the original one where Fritz inside the original one is trying to get a brain and he grabs the wrong brain. He grabs an abnormal brain because he ends up destroying, like damaging the other one. And so... I think that's what happens, right? Yeah, he, knock, he yeah, knocks, knocks the it. thing off the desk. Yeah, so Fritz grabs the abnormal brain, and that's the whole thing, like, you know, like the monster is kind of messed up inside of the first movie, inside 1931. And then inside this one, Victor specifically kills somebody. So he goes on, like, you know, he's, he's killing people to get the parts. Like the smartest guy he can find, yeah. he kills. He's like, oh, and then he's like supposed to be like a friend. He's like, oh, so great to see you, Victor. And he's like, they walk upstairs, like, look at this painting. And he's like... Ah, oh, he shoves him off the the painting, uh, some off the banister. It crashes through it, busts his head, and he takes that brain. And by the way, piece of trivia: when you're watching the movie and he pushes the guy off the banister, right. the actual stuntman fell down and smacked his head on the actual floor. Oh, and you can see in in the actual thing, you'll see that his body hits the pad because you can see like the floor indents where it's supposed right. to be. But where he smacks his head 
is actually on the ground. You can see him. He smacks the head and he bounces up. Man, it hits so hard. That's way better trivia than than my trivia about that scene. Oh, what well, was it? Well, just that he never bothers to fix a banister after he shoves the guy off there. That's right. Yeah, it shows later in the movie. Doesn't he yeah. just walk by it? Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's just open still. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been months or years or something afterwards or whatever. Been, nope, still still busted. Hey, remember that guy died right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah huh. that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, but oh, man, it was, you know, he went right through the banister. Good thing we don't have that there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. This is a memory. <laughs> this is to remind us how dangerous this is. <laughs> but yeah, the uh he, that some man actually got hurt pretty bad. <laughs> and yeah. then um the makeup, of course, we have to talk about the creature in this, right? So right. we have the classic Jack Pierce one and the original one. We have another classic interpretation of the creature. Probably the second most famous version of it which is funny because I would say a majority of people don't know this one. It's Christopher Lee and because they couldn't use the makeup, they didn't really have an idea because they were really rushed to shoot. So they just kind of like stuck some stuff on his face and were like, okay, that'll work. Right. But because the way they did it, they didn't like cast anything. They didn't do a mask. It's not a rubber thing. It's just like the, you know, like the makeup putty stuff. They had to take a photo and they just do it from scratch every single day that they shot. Rough. And it was not very fun for Christopher Lee. He did go through some some pretty interesting physical stuff as well during this. Not nearly as many as when Christopher Lee was the mummy. When he was the mummy, oh my gosh. He got like, I think it like snapped both his ankles. He like threw out his back. He got like, I mean, there's so, there's so many different things when he did that movie. But on this one, when the creature gets shot, it's like the blood that pours out. Right. And apparently it got into his eye, his actual eye. And so when you hear that scream, it's actually him going, ah, you know, like, mm. and then they kept it in the movie. And so uh, Christopher Lee, like, I, I got him credit. Even the, like, he had the contacts for Dracula where he couldn't see and it was like burned his eyes and all stuff. Like, he, they just tortured the crap out of that guy. Yeah. But uh, this is before unions in film. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait about <laughs> that. It was funny because the way to get him to do, like, there's a whole story of him being, uh, you know, when he was Dracula and that was really the bread and butter, you know, Frankenstein and Dracula were like, that's what kept the studio afloat. Right. And every time they would like try to guilt trip Christopher Lee to do another one. And when he's like, I'm not doing another one. So he's like, well, we already sold the movie. And if you don't do it, then everyone will get fired and lose their jobs. And so like, there's like one movie where he's like, oh, like they only did it to like for the studio to give them like the people wow. work. Yeah. Is it, that's such a. We all know who the real monster is. The movie the making movie, machine. movie making machine. That's the yeah, real creature. That's the real creature. It's a King Kong moment. A um, little bit of trivia. Okay. The tank they used to bring the creature back to life mm -hmm. is the main inspiration for the Rocky Horror tank. Yeah, it looks exactly the same. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I thought, was, I thought that was a good piece of trivia. Yeah. Because when you see it, you're like, is that not the same thing? Is that yeah, I, I did have to look up look up a frame out of the movie versus the other movie, Rocky Horror versus mm -hmm. uh, Curse of Frankenstein. See yeah. if it was the same? I had to do, I had to do a side-by-side -side oh. and just see what the differences were. How but, daring. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it took a lot of work. You know, probably maybe 27 keystrokes. Whoa. Something like that. Yeah. Nice. There's an element to this movie that I think is really, I don't know if it's confusing or, or is weird it's weird if you watch the rest of the movies. And that is the element at the... And it's huge spoilers. If you want to watch this movie, go do it. It's amazing, right? If you don't want to hear spoilers, tune on now. Go watch the movie, come back. And that is that Elizabeth is shot. So, Victor shoots. Like, there's a whole big standoff, right? Where the creature has Elizabeth. And Victor is... They're on this roof. And he shoots and seemingly hits elizabeth right wounds her and all stuff and so he's like freaking out and the whole keep in mind the whole story takes place from the point of view of victor telling a story the original did not it kind of has a weird psychological element at the end where he's telling a story or whatever and paul shows up and he's like i can't believe you know he's like paul tell him a story tell him tell him i'm innocent you know because they think that he just like killed these people or something and so you know he's in jail right and he's like, I don't know what he's talking about at all. Paul's like, yeah, you know, I don't know. And he walks out and Elizabeth is there and fine. Right. And so, there's this whole element of like, wait, what happened? And then at the end, the end of the movie, the ending shot of the movie is Victor. Right. In the guillotine. That's the end of the movie. That's how the movie ends. And so, it's kind of like, 
wait, what happened? <laughs> like, it's kind of like one of those things where it tries to play on like that. Wait, did this happen? Did it, you know, because Elizabeth seems unfazed with what happened and if she was shot or I don't know. It's like, it's such a weird ending. But it makes even less sense if you watch the sequels because they kind of don't really even reference any of that. And uh, in spoiler, in the sequel, uh, Frankenstein escapes the guillotine. <laughs> like, it's uh, for many, many more movies. By the way, it's the most, most ridiculous things about the series. Mm. In one movie, he's hiding. He calls himself Dr. Frank. In another movie, he calls himself Dr. Stein. Nice. Isn't that great? Yeah. Because nobody will figure that out. Nope. We got an APB on Frankenstein. Oh, what's your name again? Dr. Frank. Ah, uh, all right. Oof. Can't, Clear. It's not him. Yeah. Clear. Uh, I'll move along. Let's go to Transylvania. Sorry to, sorry to bother you, sir. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. You got have good... a good day with that big old knife. Whatever you're doing with that. <laughs> you have a good day with your big brain. Big, juicy, supple brain. Yep. I will. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's so weird. It's just a really good movie. I, I love it. And I think it's probably my favorite is my favorite in the whole franchise for the Frankenstein franchise. I think it does it the best. Yeah, it is really, really good. They do a lot of uh, good work with uh, character motivations. And um, I mean, you don't really understand uh, Victor's perspective um, other than just being super obsessed. But as far as character motivation for the rest of them, it's pretty easy to understand. It's, they're believable characters. There's a lot of, de- you know, development uh, the character introduction in general in the beginning is really good. The s- inside sets are really believable and, yeah. and well done. Even the sound. There's a, a time when they're doing a toast and they're, they're clinking glasses and you can hear the, the ting of crystal, uh, which is different than the sound of clinking glass. And so even that was on point. All right. Yeah. Dang. Can't fire. Plus, they also lit a guy on fire and he was really scared. <laughs> the stunt man at the end when they light him on yeah, fire yeah. as a creature. It's like a quote where he's like, yeah, there was like three guys standing around with fire extinguishers. He's like, I wasn't really too sure about this whole situation. Oh, Put on that asbestos suit. But he lives. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Frankenstein 1957. We'll probably eventually get over to the, the actual Hammer series of Frankenstein movies because they're so interesting, but uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is Frankenstein 1957. Go watch it. Highly recommended. Brian, you know, I'm over the 50s. I want to get out of here. Let's get to a time where flannel was the thing. Yeah. Alternative rock was filling MTV. Yeah. And then people in this decade really didn't like the decade. They liked the 70s. But people forget that. And now they just talk about that time as if everybody liked that time. I see. Yeah. Let's do 1994. Oh, okay. Now, if we could have a Frankenstein film. Oh, I see. I, I was wondering why you chose 94 specifically. I was just random. Yeah. It just happens oh, to be okay. that there was a Frankenstein. Oh, and movie. that reminded you of the Frankenstein. It reminded me okay, of it, yeah. Got it. All now, right. hopefully, this one could be directed by the same guy who stars in the main role, and then this production gets off the rails, and then we will end up with some really weird version of Frankenstein. Man, you are you are two for two. Donnie, you are so in luck. Yeah? Yeah. Am You're I? so in luck. I am. Because... I've got this movie. It's uh, it's Mary, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Now, does it have anything to do with Bram Stoker's Dracula? No. No? No. Well, kind of it does. Well, no, but it, but it, it but re- it's, a, it's a completely different book. Well, yes. It, yeah. Bram, that is Bram true. Stoker wrote Dracula. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, this is a very weird version of Frankenstein. Well, how it came into being is very controversial in some ways. So you gotta remember that in the '90s, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Francis Ford Coppola one with Keanu Reeves, and Gary Oldman, Winona Ryder, that was a big movie. That movie did very well, and it was just super popular. Yeah. And so uh, Francis Ford Coppola, like he wanted to do a version of Frankenstein as well. He basically wanted to redo the Universal movies, right? Right. And when he did Dracula, he's like, "Oh, cool! Like now they, there can be a Frankenstein version," but he didn't want to direct it. But he did produce it. So he got Kenneth Branagh to direct this version. And he also, but then also he was going to be starring in it. Okay. Keep in mind, he's a pretty good actor in his own ways. You know, Hamlet is probably the thing he's most famous for. The projects he's been involved in, you know, he's also been Harry Potter. Harry Potter. He, yeah, Chamber of Secrets, you know. He's done some interesting stuff, but my God, this is not one of the interesting things he should be remembered for. Uh, Yeah, he, he shouldn't be remembered for it, but 
this movie is is very interesting. It is. So in the in the same way that Francis Ford Coppola did Dracula and took a lot of elements from the book, you know, added in a lot of stuff that hadn't been seen in any of the movies. That's what happened with this version. I gotta say, I just I had so many problems with this movie. I will say the creature is played by Robert De Niro. Yes, Robert De Niro. Taxi driver Robert De Niro. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Rob, actual Robert De Niro. Right. At the time, you gotta remember, he was, like, he had burst in, you know, back into the scene with uh, Cape Fear, you know, where he kind of got back into, you know, being limelight and everything, and he was doing lots of really good stuff around this time. I'll talk more about his performance in a minute, because I feel like that's gonna be something I want to talk about a lot. Okay. But Francis Ford Coppola saw where it was going and how he was doing with this movie, and he actually, like, publicly said, you know, like, I don't support this movie anymore. Like, this is getting way off of what I thought it should be, and it's not anything that's I approve of. There's a, a whole bunch of other behind-the-scenes stuff. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But uh, what what do you think was the inspiration to bring on John Cleese in a non-comedic role? You know, I have no idea. There's so John Cleese, obviously super famous, Monty Python, the, tons of other stuff, right? Right. He is one of uh, Victor's. And came out. We do get. Yes, yeah, still named Victor Frankenstein. We have Elizabeth. We have, you know, a lot of the main characters in this. But uh, John Cleese plays one of his teachers and kind of teaches him about, you know, bringing life back in a weird thing. So he's not not a comedic role at all for John Cleese. They put these really weird prosthetics on his face to like make him look less like John Cleese. Yeah, it just it looks weird. Like it looks like he's wearing like something's on his face. I don't know why they brought him back though. It's really strange. I do know that they, they were apprehensive because he's only comedic, but then when they put him in the movie, they don't even let him like emote essentially, like what the way he naturally could, because they put all the crap on his face. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird choice that, in both both cases. Well, you do have one of the goth superstars, Helena Bonham Carter, very young Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, on this movie that caused some controversy as well because she does play Elizabeth. Very interesting role for her acting this. I think she's probably one of the better parts of it. Uh, behind the scenes, actually, she did ha- start an affair. So Kenneth was the you know director slash star Victor. Uh, he was married at this time and then had an affair with Helena Bonham Carter on this movie, and uh, that was that's not cool. Yeah, uh, so that just added to the production strangeness. Really what this is, and I know I'm kind of skirting around like actually the quality of the movie here. It is in some ways a much more faithful adaptation of the book. It added, it adds in essentially the other part that was taken out where you actually see it from the monster's perspective, where the monster learns to speak, where a lot of that stuff, even the opening, even the opening yeah. part of it is pretty much from the book. And kind of identi- like like leading you to identify with the monster, like yes. humanizing him and, and making yeah. him somebody you identify with. Which is what the book does so amazingly. Yeah. Like, and, you know, it presents the two perspectives. I think, unfortunately, the worst part of this movie is Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. He, to me, is not very likable. I can't seem to really figure out if I agree with him or not on anything. He's like wildly epic in a 90s way. Like, he's just, like, supposed to be, like, this savant kind of, I'm not good at this, but I'm so good at this, and, like, like master of his thing. But I don't see any of it in the way he is portrayed in this movie. Right. Yeah, that is, I just struggled so much with that in this movie. I just did not like Victor at all. The style of this movie is one thing I have to mention. It has, like, a tr- it's trying to be really epic. Yeah. I swore I was watching the wrong movie for the first, I don't know, seven or eight minutes at least. Yeah. Like, it's trying to be a big, almost like, I don't want to say blockbustery, An adventure movie. Yeah. It, essentially, you have super epic music. You have these shots that are just constantly jerking back and forth. And, like, the, the creation scene, like, where he's actually creating the monster. Right. That is, like, insane. There's this big, giant thing. And he uses electric eels. So, what, one thing that's important to remember is that the book Frankenstein actually doesn't say how he brought the creature to life. Right? It doesn't say... Oh, he raised up the thing and the electricity shot him, whatever. So movies have the liberty to to kind of get their own ideas of it, right? Yeah. And each movie does differently. You know, <laughs> thir- thir- thirty one was lightning, fifty seven was you know all the weird electro machines. 
And what, what does this one do? He builds the creature. Yeah. And it's like using a whole bunch of, you know, different kinds of bipartisans. He's huge, big monstrous creature. Very accurate to the book. I would say it is pretty, much, much closer to that. But he builds himself like this big giant coffin thing. And I'm wondering if they're trying to like get steampunk cred for that. <laughs> Probably. It's a little steampunk. It is, but, yeah. But that's yeah. kind of before that a little bit. But yeah. still, I mean, well, the concept, you know, of the, the look. Yeah. Um, the look, yeah. But yeah, like, he uses like amniotic fluid to fill it. And yeah. then he uses, and this is in his lab. And by this so ridiculously 90s epic movie thing, he has like a gigantic bag tarp thing that's filled with electric eels. And it looks like a weird, like, <laughs> testicle or something. Yeah. <laughs> it just looks like a bag of skin or something. And these eels are writhing. And keep in mind, it's like hanging from the ceiling and stuff. And so he fills the coffin with the body in it with like the amniotic fluid. And then releases the eels in there and then the eels like bite the monster and then brings him to life somehow and right. it's it's just so insanely over the top and there's all this epic music playing and he's running around the lab and, and shoving things yeah and, and, and doing doing the chains and all this stuff and he's shirtless and why is he always shirtless in this movie well it's it's because it's it's a lot of hard work making a monster oh time. yeah is that yeah, it you yeah. get really warm you know if this was if this was a late 80s movie, he would also drink iced tea while spilling it down his chest. Yes, that's true. Yeah. We just escaped that. Yeah. We just escaped it. So. But uh, it's so it's so over the top. It's so insane. It, the whole movie is like that. Uh, one of the things that annoys me so much about it is the camera. It's always rotating. Yeah. No matter what is happening. Anything. It could be there. It could be Victor and Elizabeth talking inside of, like, just the house. Camera's rotating around him. <laughs> he's walking down the street. As he's as it's following him, it's rotating around him. Yeah. A- as the creature comes up, it's, it's rotating around him. It's just always rotating. There's no, like, mystery to any scene. There's no, like... Uh, what year did they invent steady cam? I was going to say segways, but... Uh, I think it was like 1979, because really? okay. The Shining was like one of the first uses of steady cam. Oh, gotcha. And that was okay. 1980. Hey, there's something I didn't know. There you go. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to figure out, like, was there a technological thing where they're like, oh, we can use this now, so let's use the heck out of it? I have no idea, but... Yeah. And it's really strange because, it, to me, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry to anybody who likes this movie a lot, because I am just ripping it a new one. <laughs> um, I really wanted to like this movie because there's so many good elements to it and you know trying to follow the book and trying to do stuff. but it is a lot like dracula the francis ford coppola version of dracula in that it does take it while it does follow a lot of things from the story it also adds an insane amount of things that are not from the story and i'm okay with that if they're done well and yeah. this was not done well you know obviously inside of inside of the book dracula they're not wearing those crazy costumes and there's all this, you know a lot of the elements and stuff aren't you know, it's not in the book, but they decided to include it. I understand like what they were going for with this, but none of it works. It's just a mess. It just feel it feels like a mess. It's super long, by the way. It's a really long movie. Yeah. But you know what does work about this movie so well, and I enjoyed it a ton. Can, what? Can you guess? Um, that really, really tall stairwell without a railing. No. What was, no. Oh, what was up with that? <laughs> yeah, I noticed that too. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I was watching it. I was like, man, I wonder if anybody ever felt... There's like this... Like in the house, they have the really epic sets. By the way, this movie, if you ever want costume... If you just want a movie where you can put it on silent and you look at the costumes and the set design and you just want to hear the word expensive go through your mind, Yeah, this was it. Yeah. Because some the sets are so elaborate. They're so crazy. The stairwell... There's like literally a gigantic, huge stairwell. No railing. I'm like somebody just fall off there and they just put leeches on him or something <laughs> like yeah it reminded me of that stairwell inside the house at the top of the hill in edward scissorhands yes i would yeah yeah say but i think they had a railing because they're not idiots right professor was smart he didn't know how to complete edward but he knew how to build a staircase yeah no handrail on the on the wall side either so i mean there's no bracing yourself yeah at all you on either fall. side yeah you're, you're screwed yeah the one thing i really liked about it in surprising was Robert De Niro as the creature. I thought Robert De Niro did as good of a job as he could have done. Yeah, like that. I, you could literally just cut the movie from the point at which 
the creature is escaping. Yes. And start from there. And it'd be a good movie. Yeah. And just cut out all the bits where it's it's just Victor and, and Elizabeth doing and talking about whatever they're doing. What do you mean? About. I'm in school. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Victor talks most of the movie, by the way. But yeah, Robert De Niro. Like, come on, I've seen this movie before, but you know, like I always say, whenever we watch stuff or listen to stuff for review, it's a very different experience. Right. Because you're like trying to figure out like, is this actually good? Because you're not, you're not just putting it on and on your phone or something like that. You're not just feeling like, oh, it's a good background movie. Like you're like, what? What is this movie trying to do? You know, like yeah. There and there's a lot of movies that I don't think are good movies, but I still find entertaining. Yeah, and so, we t- and we always yeah. tell them too. Like if we if that's if that's the case, the Robert De Niro stuff is a- truly heartbreaking. I mean, as a creature, I really believed. Like I get it that it's Robert De Niro and the thing. And actually, a big criticism that people had when this movie came out was. They couldn't not see Robert De Niro in it. You know, they were like, no matter how hard I look, like, oh, well, it was Robert De Niro. And right. I get it. He has a very distinctive face, very distinctive eyes, all this stuff. But for me, I think his acting really went along with it, like to, to help sell the illusion of this. And I felt so much sympathy for the creature in this, mostly because I hated Frankenstein like that <laughs> <laughs> like, so badly that it helped me even be like, yeah. Yeah, he is a dick. Like, yeah. And uh, I love those parts. If, if you ever want anything of this movie, just do like the first 20 minutes of the monster story and you'll see like why this movie worked or how it worked. I said, when it goes back to the human characters, I just don't really care. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not, they're not really interesting and you don't, there's no bond there. There's no, we don't have any investment in them. Yeah, that's, extremely true and oh god there's some weird other stuff i mean basically the whole the whole the things that's heartbreaking about it is you see the the creature and it is like the book in that he he just wants to be accepted by people but he's so monstrous that people just can't accept him for the way he looks you know he just is huge big bulky guy and you even see the realization of like when he realized that he's been sewn back together you know he's sewn from other people right and, you know, because he, the whole way the creature, like, learns of his existence is through Victor's journal. And he learned, he discovered, like, you see through the movie, just through his eyes, through his body language, you just see him realize, like, oh, my gosh, I am a stitched together project, you know? And... Uh, it feels very real. Yeah. And it just stands out so much in this movie where everyone's overacting. It's big. It's epic, whatever. And then you just have this really soft performance by Robert De Niro. I'm just like... Who would have thought Robert De Niro would be the the most understandable, relatable character in a film, you know? Right. Like where he, you're like, you can actually feel sympathy for him and it's just like, you know, a guy who normally plays such a, like subversive characters, you know, characters who you just love to hate, you know, like Cape Fear and and you know, even Taxi Driver, you don't really relate to, actually, you shouldn't relate to Travis Bickle, I hope not. But, <laughs> you know, and like every, all those mafia movies he did and stuff. And it's just like, it's so weird that I'm like, oh man, this is like a really gentle performance in you know, through like a character who's supposed to be very large and imposing, and you're just like, dang, how the hell do they do that? Yeah, it's too bad it's attached to the rest of the movie. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I don't really have a whole lot of other things to say other than the old headline style of grammar at the beginning of the movie uh, for kind of getting you caught up to what the story is you're coming in on really bothered me because the grammar is so terrible. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have recognized John Cleese if I didn't know John Cleese very well (laughs) uh, because of the way that he looked and you know, what they, what they had done. I don't understand why he gave up so fast when it didn't work, when he thought it didn't work. And he's just like, Oh, you know, I'm going to destroy everything, all my notes and whatever else. Like, why did he give up so fast? If, if he, you can't really understand what's motivating Victor in, in a lot of moments in this is, is, you know, there are actions that don't make sense based on what you've seen and what they revealed. And and even later on, what they end up revealing, they still don't make sense, you know. Well, that's just the whole thing about, like, why the human... Like, you can't connect with any humans because you're they don't seem relatable yeah. in any way. This movie's just a mess. It's a mess. Well, just like Dracula, you know, they could have done it so much better. I mean, Francis Ford Coppola, like, gave Kenneth notes and said, hey, you need to cut, like, this part of the movie. You need to cut this out. You need to do this. And he just wouldn't listen yeah. And you got this bloated, super long movie that has some pretty good scenes in it, some pretty good acting, 
sandwiched between a whole bunch of freaking rotating shots of people trying their worst accents, <laughs> like of old English. Of the three movies, this is absolutely the worst Frankenstein and the best creature. Ah, man. That's a hard one. Well, okay. Yes, in... in I think as far as... Like, the book. As the far, book, as, yeah, far yeah. as the actual story of Frankenstein, yeah, this is, this is the closest version of the creature I've ever seen on film. And some of it is like, I mean, it's really close. And it's, it is very heartbreaking too. Like genuinely made me feel, but it's like, it's just so bad. It's so bad. It's like unwatchable at some points. It was making me sick with just the way it's edited. Oh. By the way, there's some spoilers here. I, mean, I guess it's already been spoiled in this episode, but you shouldn't watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a spoiler. <laughs> it's uh, so they do include the whole thing of Elizabeth of the creature, ki- like the creature in the book. He demands Victor makes him a bride, right? Right. And when he refuses, then he kills Elizabeth and then right. brings her back. Right. And this is like this is actually like a whole thing, like you know, but the whole thing of bringing Elizabeth back that's that's super cool that they decided to do that. But this, first of all, there's a really weird scene where Elizabeth is brought back by Victor. Uh, keep in mind, the creature like murdered the hell out of her, like ripped her heart out. And it's like a really weird thing where the monster and Victor are standing next to one another and are like, come to me, come to me. No, 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 Elizabeth, come to me like a dog. Right. And it's like, and then she comes to Vic, is it Victor? Does she go to Victor and then it's like, oh, she realizes like she's been, like her face is badly burned and all stuff. She's like completely mutilated. Yeah. And, and she, she realizes that she's more like the creature. Yeah, and she like looks at herself in the mirror and is like, oh my gosh, and then she just takes a thing and lights herself on fire with a really bad CG effect, by the way. Really terrible effect. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty, it's a very interesting set piece to it, but it's again, it's just executed very poorly. Like the whole scene just feels super awkward. It doesn't feel like that meaningful. I mean, the whole setting is on fire. That's pretty brutal. That's pretty crazy, but like, the actual, like, if you watch the scene, like, I think I'm describing it better than the movie does a good job of, <laughs> of filming it. Because you're just like, it's just so awkward. God, it's awful. <laughs> just, I I don't think I'll ever watch this movie again. I'll probably watch the, the Robert De Niro parts because those are awesome. But, God, so much of this. It could have it honestly been, like, about 40 minutes shorter, and I would have been probably way more satisfied with this film. But it's the fact that it's bloated. It's just a director who didn't know what he was doing and just even couldn't take criticism. I mean, Prince for Coppola, you know? So couldn't even get through to him. So yeah, that's that's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Don't watch it. Duh, and for that, that movie. Yeah. It's over. It's By the way, you can sometimes get in a double pack with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Another tie in. Yeah. And sometimes I think they include the mummy one in there too. That was Frankenstein. This was our Frankenstein episode. What a disappointing ending. You know, I don't like that he called body parts just raw materials, right? Does that? Yep. Yeah. It's too bad, you know, he ended up losing an arm, a leg, his brother's body. Oh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> nice. I have a note here Super Toad, and I'm sure that was really funny when I wrote it down, but I don't know what it, I don't remember what Super it was. Toad. Super Toad. Yeah. Super Toad. They bring a toad back to life? I don't remember. Oh, that's because, right. Because it, it had super strength, right? It shattered the the enclosure it was in. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. That's right. And so they're they're alluding to the fact that the creature will also have super strength. Super toad. Right. So super toad. Yeah. I like it. Anyway, this has been our Frankenstein episode of Gothcast. I mean, well, there may be other ones in the future if anybody ever wants to do a series of them or just we decide to do like, oh, more Frankenstein. There's so many Frankenstein films, by the way. We could we could be doing them. We could do just episodes on Frankenstein films for a long time and we would never run out of things because there's so many different interpretations. You ever, you ever heard of Andy Warhol's Frankenstein? No. Oh, my God. It is like unwatchable. Oh, so terrible. Maybe we'll watch it one time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can review us on iTunes always beneficial to you because eventually we'll have some kind of giveaway again and you could maybe win some stuff if there's a review that's up there at the moment you can follow us on instagram you can follow us on youtube go just search Gothcast video just search Gothcast video yeah you dingus yeah <laughs> <laughs> just search Gothcast video just search Gothcast video 
<laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could follow us on Facebook. You know, anywhere you do social media, we usually have some sort of thing available to you. But I uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode. And of course, oh, tell all your friends. Yes. Tell your friends. Tell your friends. Why not tell your friends? Yeah. Your friends want to hear great things. Yeah. If you thought this was great, you should be sharing it with them. Yeah, because that would make you a great friend. And if you think this is terrible, why are you listening? Why are you listening? Especially you made it this far. Yeah. It's because you, you like to make fun of us? Well, then make fun of us with your friends, yeah, too. Yeah, make a... Uh, put it on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make sure to... Uh, what's that thing? What's that? Uh, what am I saying? Stay spooky. Stay spooky.